we haven't been discussing about addiction at all. We've been discussing about drug seeking habits, but this is still far from addiction, which Omar, as I mentioned to you earlier on, is compulsivity. And <coughs> what is very important, I think. Uh oh. Turn your microphone on. Uh, sorry. But we are not equally vulnerable to addiction. So when one individual come, on, come to Earth, he comes with a pack of genes that are, you know, dependent upon polymorphisms or whatever you want. Unfortunately, perhaps not unfortunately, but he's contaminated by, the, by his mother's story because of some imprinting and some epigenetic mechanisms. And this pool of genes interacts with a specific environment to shape a personality that would eventually one day meet with drugs, and when clinicians <coughs> meet with these people, they're in the stage in which they are already suffering from a neuropsychiatric disorder. And the retrospective analysis of the potential substrates and etiological mechanisms driving the transition to the pathology is really difficult to apprehend from clinical studies. And the real question about vulnerability to addiction is the interaction between environment and genes shaping personality and the interaction of these with the drug. And I'm going to discuss briefly the notion of contribution of impulsivity, a bit of anxiety, sensation seeking, decision making processes, sweet, sweetness preference, hedonics, whatever you want. So if we come back to the epidemiological data, out of 100 persons who first use cocaine, only 15 to 10, 20 percent would eventually develop drug addiction. And these 20, 15 to 20 percent have a, display a really high rate of relapse. Even though they could abstain from seeking and taking drugs for years, eventually they, they have a risk of relapsing of 85 percent. But the key question is, these pink guys my burning question is, these pink guys, they were pink before they took the drug, before they knew. Is there any way we can identify personality, behavioral substrates, and neurological, under, uh, under neurological substrates of vulnerability to addiction? <coughs> and in order to do that, you've got to take into account inter-individual differences. We are not equally vulnerable. And with Véronique de Roche doing my PhD, we've been, trained, we've, we've been thinking about a way of operationalizing the way people are, are diagnosed uh, drug addicts according to the DSM-4. So as I mentioned earlier on, we didn't focus on tolerance and withdrawal, but we focused on the persistence of drug seeking when it's not available. And I mentioned too that in the self-instruction setting, we introduced periods when the drug is not available but signal that as so. Then we focused on these motivational aspects and checked the motivation for the drug measured in a progressive ratio shader of enforcement and continued substance use despite knowledge of having persistent or recurrent physical or psychological problem. We've been measuring it as continued drug self-administration despite the association of an electric shock. So how did we, I'm going to focus on the methodology of, sh of punishment because there are several punishments and I'd like to emphasize the aspect of it. So for the sake of the story, this is seeking when, when the drug is not available, motivation and resistance to punishment. This is how we develop the model of resistance to punishment. Every day the animals are trained under an FF5 schedule of reinforcement, which is every single fifth liver press the animal receives a cocaine infusion that is associated with illum illumination of the conditioned stimulus. And during the shock sessions, the first time the animal presses, a shock associated stimulus turns on. And this is a key element here because it, it introduces a Pavlovian condition suppression component to the procedure. So what is condition suppression?
So it splits the other way around. <coughs> yeah? So, and this light is on pretty much all the time. Then, if the rat presses three more times, so such that he, he reaches FR4, he, re he receives the shock, the first shock that is not paired with cocaine. If the rat really wants to go to the cocaine, and if within, if within a minute he presses one more time, then he receives the shock, and subsequently the CS and the drug, such that every single time one rat wants to receive a cocaine infusion, he's got to go through two shocks. Okay, but if it, the animal after the elimination here of the stimulus or after the fourth liver press doesn't press one more time here or three more time here within four minutes or one minute, everything starts again from scratch. So you can have animals in the session receiving 20 shocks, never receiving cocaine because they would always stop here. You would have animals never receiving a shock because when they see a guy is going to hurt, they stop. And you would have animals that say, ah, let's go. It's going to hurt. I mean, I'm going to have my drug. Okay? So now if you plot the population on the three criteria we've been investigating, this is the frequency, and this is the different breakpoint levels in the progressive ratio session. Does everybody know about progressive ratio? Everybody knows about proxy ratio. So when was it introduced? <laughs> we don't know that. Chris. 1963. By someone who was called Hodos. And it was done for milk, for food reinforcement. The underlying hypothesis was the more you want something, the more likely you are to work for it. And if you increase the behavioral cost to get the same amount of reward at one point, it would, the animal would stop responding, and this breakpoint would be an index of the motivation. This is perfect for no drug rewards. Absolutely perfect. It's quite less perfect for drug rewards, because definitely after the first infusion, there's a drug onboard component that can drive the behavior perhaps even more than the motivation itself. Sergei Maida suggested to, after every single drug infusion, introduce a timeout in the progressive ratio schedule. That is a clever idea. Or there are another way to play around with that is to really increase the ratios. So there's, I think in Chris' book with Veronique Deroche, we, we actually we have a figure in which we show how we developed a progressive ratio for this test. And if, if generally the cumulative response is look like that, we did this. So that to get his fifth infusion, the animal alwe already have, has to press, I don't know, 1,500 times. I have rats that would press 35,000 times within three hours. I have rats that actually dug into the liver, pressing. But so that's the progressive ratio we use. And now we also use, in the progressive ratio, we normalize the breakpoint by the behavioral output the animal gives every day. Under FA5 schedule of enforcement, when there is a timeout of 30 seconds or 40 seconds as we use, and the levers aren't retracted, some rats would obtain 30 infusions pressing 151 times. Only once they would have pressed outside, no. Some rats would press 400 times because they would press during the timeout. Okay? If you ask one rat that presses every day 400 times to press 400 times on the operative ratio schedule, the amount of behavior that is actually monitored on the operative ratio schedule is exactly the one the animal gives every day. There's no effort there as compared to one rat that presses every day 150 times for the same amount of drug. So we now normalize the breakpoint by the baseline output, behavioral output, okay? So that's a log normal distribution for motivation, a log normal distribution for the drug-seeking responses 
in these periods where the drug is not available but signal also. And this is the bimodal distribution for resistance to punishment. And we were really happy that the nature was such that some animals here really do not belong to the same population as some animals here. So this is the number of drug infusions the animal would receive when they receive the shock as compared to their baseline. So most of the population, 50% of the population, takes less than 20% of the infusions when they receive the shock. But some animals take 100%. They just don't care. You put them on a hot plate, you do run free, whatever you want, their pain sensitivity is the same. But thanks to this bimodal distribution, we have now an objective criterion to say we will apply, we've got to identify rats. We will apply a threshold, which is perhaps 30% of the population, 40% of the population, depending on the spread of this distribution, but we're gonna apply a threshold here, let's say 33%, to every single test. And every rat that is in the first 33% top of the population will say this rat has one criterion for this behavior, okay? And then we do the sum of this behavior. So that's exactly that, the spread of the population, the 33% threshold, animals here, animals here, animals here, they have one criterion, two criterion. Some animals are always outside this top 30% of the population and they have zero criterion. And the purpose of the model is to compare zero criteria rats with three criteria rats. Okay? And if you compare them, I already showed you that, three criteria rats display, obviously they have been selected for that, higher scores for each of the criteria, and much higher than the zero, but also the two or the one criteria rat. Don't ask me what the one and the two criteria rats are, because we can't say it's abuse, because abuse in the DSM-4 or ICD-10 is defined by specific criteria that are not quantitatively less than addiction, it's something else. So we just focus on the one three criteria rat. But when we sold the paper initially, we also built up an addiction severity score, which is the sum of the z-scores for each of these criteria. A z-score is computed as every single rat score is divided by the standard deviation of the population, and you actually subtract to it the average of the population, such that the final distribution is centered on to zero with the standard deviation of one. So you can then add them. And we've shown that zero criteria rats display negative addiction severity, and three criteria rats display an addiction severity score that is above the standard deviation of the overall population. So they are far, far, far gone. And we try to say that we end up with 15 to 21% of a population of heterogeneous population displaying the three criteria, uh, the three, the three criteria and, and this fits well with the um, distribution in humans. Interestingly, if you look at the average daily intake, zero and three criteria rats, this is the time course on one experiment, on the second experiment, they don't differ from three criteria rats. So drug, the level of self-administration doesn't predict anything. What's interesting here is that with the same exposure, pharmacological exposure to cocaine, you end up with different phenotypes at the end of the day. So it's a real chain drug interaction that is driving the behavior. <coughs> Sorry. I don't know how to go back. Something changed with my keyword. Uh, I, the, fir the, fir the previous slide was to show that if you give the three criteria rats extended access to cocaine only once, they would escalate much more than zero criteria rats, which suggests that escalation is not necessarily something that can drive the transition to compulsivity. It can also be the expression of a compulsive behavior. And you can expose rats to the same amount of drug and show escalation if you have selected them on the basis of interindividual differences. And after withdrawal, three criteria rats show increased vulnerability to relapse induced by non-contingent uh, infusions of cocaine as compared to uh, zero criteria rats. So overall, this model, based on inter-individual differences, recapitulates the diagnostic strategy of, of addiction in humans. It comes from an inter individual drug interaction. It predicts loss of control, escalation over drug taking, and it predicts increased vulnerability to relapse. So 
So we thought this was a great model with heuristic value with regards to the definition of addiction in humans, even though it only refers to drug-taking behavior, nothing about drug-seeking behavior. So that's not the perfect model, far, far from that. So once we were able to, yep? Um, so before the reinstatement, do those, they undergo extinction? The so we do only, a, it's a within session test, so they do, they do 90 minute extensions prior to that. I see. But yeah. I've never ever done repeated extension sessions. Because okay. I don't know what is the relevance of that with regards to treatment or situations in humans. So we, we do actually abstinence, and then eventually you put the animals back in the box. So you've got context-induced relapse, but for 90 minutes they extinguish, and then either you stress them, you present non-contingency, and then contingency CSs, whatever you want. So that's how we do. Is oncogenic or is anti oncogenic Well, it, 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 it should reduce the stress of the shock. This I'm not sure. I, I think it will. It, it's definitely an analgesic. Okay. So I, I just wonder if a proportion of the animals just learn that when they, if they have a cocaine shock before, the next shock won't be so bad. But the point is, actually, most of the animals never reach cocaine, the first cocaine, ever. Yeah, and they do have a little, uh, actually, uh, they don't go back. Sorry? And once they do uh, reach their first, uh, their first uh, cocaine infusion, I mean, you don't learn. So I, w I think it's like 30% of the animals, when they, they see the shock-rated CS, mm -hmm. they stop responding. So they are sensitive to condition suppression. 30% of the animals, when they receive the first shock, they stop. And, and the 40% that remain, actually, when they first press once and they see the shock-rated stimulus, their behavior completely changes. And especially in impressive animals, they start jumping everywhere. They try to jump on the lever to avoid the grid. Mm -hmm. So they know it's going to hurt. Yeah. And they do that every single time. It's not as if they don't care. It's just uh, they, they know it's going to hurt. Sorry. I was going to say, in some, some stimulants actually, like, potentiate Yeah, I, I, I wonder about that. I just wonder if it's a, a, a if it alters if, if a cocaine shock. Well, you could test that. Oh yeah. I mean, you could you could you could see if it does. But the point is, if we were to you give them a shot for for pneumonia. Yes, but there's you know neurobiologically, a self-administered infusion and an experimental delivered infusion had nothing to do. Actually, if these, these animals, what, the way they take cocaine, if I was to yoke another one, is dead. Uh, because I'll show you how they take They don't take cocaine, no, actually, they don't titrate. I'll show you what they do. But so the point is, we have, we have a phenotype that could be used to predict vulnerability to addiction. And we've, with Jeff Daly in Cambridge, we've been investigating the relationships between impulsivity and compulsivity, so I, I'm going to go fast because we've been through that already. How do we measure impulsivity? This is typically a five-hole box in which we would set up the five-choice serial reaction time task. That is a task of sustained attention, the right analogous of the continuous performance task in humans. The rat has to monitor these five holes. There would be a brief flash of light in one of these holes. It's got to poke in there and get dispersed. Okay? The number of good responses is an index of attention, as well as the number of omissions if the animal doesn't poke at all when there's a light. And if the animal pokes before the onset of the light, this is an index of premature responding. So that's how it looks. A light, the animal pokes and he goes and he gets his pellet. And sometimes you ask him to wait a bit more and he pokes first because he can't wait to know exactly what is the good action that I'm going to be made. And this, in turn, differences. So high impulsive animals, 
if you challenge them and ask them to wait a bit more, they would express more premature responses than the other. They don't differ in attention. They don't differ in, in, in the latency to collect the pellet. So it's not a motivational deficit. But they have lower D2 binding in the ventral cerebellum, and they escalate cocaine as compared to low impulsive animals. And if you actually challenge these animals, the same cohort, you screen the cohort on the basis of impulsivity and locomotor reactivity to novelty. So every single rat first is tested in an, op an open field for two hours, and we identify high responders, low responder rats, and then the entire cohort is trained in the five choice. And just to mention, the training in the five choice is a 100 day experiment on its own. They are trained the five choice and you identify high and low impulsive animals. And because every rat has been screened in different tasks, then you can so show that high impulsive animals do don't differ from low impulsive animals in terms of locomotor reactivity to novelty and high responders and low responders don't differ in terms of impulsivity. So these are, these are two orthogonal traits. As it had been published previously, if you give the animals access to safe administration with either vehicle and increasing doses of cocaine, these are micrograms, high, impulsive, high responder rats would acquire cocaine safe administration at doses at which low, low responder animals not even, do not even feel the drug. But there aren't any differences between high and low impulsive animals be, with regards to the acquisition of drug safe administration. However, after 60 days of safe administration, so that's already 190 days experiment, after 60 days of safe administration, you identified 0, 1, 2, or 3 crit animals in this population, and you can observe that 0 crit display negative scores, 3 crit display scores above the standard deviation, and you plot low high impulsives, low high responders in comparison with this criteria. And we end up with high impulsive animals showing really high criteria of addiction related behavior. And if you break down these behaviors, this high level of addiction like behavior in high impulsive animals comes from their, the fact that they are much more compulsive than the other animals. And I already mentioned that locomotor reactivity to novelty is a good marker of individual propensity to acquire drug self administration, but it has nothing to do with the transition to compulsivity. I'm going to skip that because we've been through that. So high impulsive animals don't shift to DLS control over behavior faster than low impulsive animals. And we've been investigating, not risk-taking that case, but different operationalization of sensation seeking. So it's been suggested that high locomotor reactivity to novelty is a model of sensation seeking, but Michael Bardo would suggest that it's actually high novelty preference when the animal has the choice between an environment he knows and a new environment, that is a model of novelty seeking. And so this is another cohort of animals. We put the animals for two hours in a circular corridor, identify high low responders, and in the same cohort, we put animals in the CPP box. So I do use CPP, but not with drugs, with novelty. And the animal is placed for 30 minutes in one compartment, put in the central, central area. He has the choice to explore one or the other compartment. And overall, the animals like novelty. They're over 50%, but high novelty prefer rats would spend up to 90% of their time for 20 minutes in a new environment. So they don't differ in terms of locomotor reactivity to novelty. Once again, we take all these animals, we train them in the three criteria experiment, and we plot the addiction score, and high novelty preference rats show really high addiction score as compared to the other animals, okay? And they show higher level of behavior in each of the three additional criteria we had, which is per se a better predictor of the transition to compulsivity than impulsivity. No, of the transition to addiction than impulsivity, because impulsivity predicted only resistance to punishment. And here, this trait predicts every single trait with regard to addiction. And once again, if you, on these other experiments, you take the frequency with regard to compulsivity and high novelty preferred rats are clustered in the compulsive subpopulation. And addiction and novelty preference is explained by the same factor that is orthogonal to locomotor reactivity. So once again, one trait clusters with addiction, novelty preference, 
not no quantile reactivity to novelty. So if you, if you take the zuck kerman sensation seeking scale and its factorial analysis, there are sub-dimensions, boredom susceptibility, thrill seeking, whatever you want. And I, I would go as far as to claim that this might be related to boredom susceptibility and thrill seeking. So these were traits measured beyond, before drug exposure. But the point is perhaps in terms of preventive strategies, you want to target these populations that have initiated drug use that haven't switched yet to drug addiction, but you want to prevent them from switching. So are there any behavioral features with regard to drug administration that predict the transition to compulsivity? Okay? So regardless the initial personality or phenotype of these animals, <coughs> I told you that they don't differ in terms of overall cocaine intake over time. But they do differ in the way they self administer cocaine. And it's a major difference. This is the best the zero criteria that we had and the best three criteria that we had. The gray bars here represent the no drug periods and every single yellow bar represents a cooking injection. And this is at day 10, day 35, and day 78 of a safe administration experiment. And I hope you'll, it's going to be obvious for you that after 30 days of safe administration, the three criteria rats, they take the same amount of drug but that way, not that way. You know, cooking self-administration, you, you know, one infusion every three minutes after they load up it is not the case at all. They binge. And here, we haven't measured that, but I'm really too bad that the transient cooking concentration in the brain and the pain concentration in the brain is absolutely not the same as you would have here. And we've shown, yep. Oh, this is something I've been thinking about is, are these in male or female rats? I might have missed. So we told you it's a, it's a mess big enough like that with males. Okay. We haven't used females yet. That's a very good question. So two, we haven't formally controlled for that. One thing I can tell you is when I did this experiment, I had two, house, actually two stabilization rooms, one in which the lights were off at 5.30 and on at 5.30 in the afternoon, and the other one four hours later, because I worked from 5, 5 to 11.30. And on... Actually, I, I have a spread of the pattern over the day. So it's, it's not clustered in one specific session. I run six sessions a day, and it was not clustered. And we actually reproduced that even in Cambridge, in which I trained the animals only from 8 to 10. We have the same, so it's, it's, it's the same. But So this pattern of intake predicts the transition to compulsivity. I'm not bad. I'm better, to, I'm better. So now, we're discussing about in genes, drug interaction, personality. Try to put that in, in the bigger picture with the interaction with the environment. Okay, so. So we've been investigating whether environmental conditions could change individuals' propensity either to require drug use or to switch from control to compulsive drug use. So we use enriched environment. So that's pretty much this cage is 1.2 meters per one meter per one meter. And this one is a basic cage, okay? Here there are two per cage, here are four per cages. We change all, you know, all, the, all the toys, everything every three days. They are highly stimulated. They run like crazy. They are happy. And these ones, they are rats. <laughs> so we had an approach in which we considered first that these 48 rats, we, we didn't consider the, the environmental condition. We, we consider this is a population. We're given a population. We don't know where they come from. And we're going to check whether there is an enrichment of specific traits depending on the environmental conditions. OK? So the strategy was like this. Rats were put in the uh, enriched environment for a month prior to be tested in the elevated plus maze for anxiety. And open fields for locomotor reactivity to novelty. We checked their sign tracking behavior, their propensity to approach uh, reward-assisted stimuli, 
the novelty preference, and then they were given access to the cocaine. Okay? I'm going to skip that because it doesn't matter. So, first, from, from this course of 48 rats. Oh! And I don't know how to come back. Oh, I think it's good. From this course of 48 rats, we are able to identify high, low, anxious animals. High, low, anxious, sweetness, preference animals. High, low, anxious, whatever you want. And then, if you consider the effect of the environment here, high animals from the enriched environment display increased saccharine preference over time than rats in the standard condition. With regards to anxiety, this is the timeline of the five minutes of the open field test. Rats in the enriched environment don't actually don't decrease in terms of time spent in open arms as do rats in the standard condition. So they, they are a bit less anxious than rats in the standard environment. This is already known, nothing new. Nothing new either. Rats, rats in an enriched environment are everything but high locomotor reactivity rats. High, high responder animals, pretty much all of them, belong to the standard condition. So this trait is heavily dependent upon the environment. Is that clear? And then this is sign tracking. So I guess every one of you perhaps, no, perhaps not, but has, has read one of Terry Robinson's papers recently. So sign tracking, you use a lever, not as a manipulant arm for an instrumental response, but as a condition stimulus. A lever comes in, a pellet is delivered in the magazine. And above the lever comes a light that is in, illuminated at the same time the, the lever comes in. So the lever is a condition stimulus and you would measure the condition approach to the condition stimulus by the number of contacts the animal makes with the lever that are not instrumental responses. He approaches the lever, so he touches it, so it's a lever press, but it has no, no scheduled consequences. Is that clear? You measure contacts with the condition stimulus versus contacts with the magazine where the pellet comes. And obviously, if the pellet is here, and if you're going there, you're not going to have it. But it's a nice model of how your behavior is driven by stimuli in the environment rather than the goal. And we found that enriched environment completely wipes out. So animals would display sign tracking. They would increase their contacts with the lever or goal tracking. They would go to the magazine. And the enriched environment completely washes out these differences between sign and goal tracking. So now these were dimensions, and we've now been considering traits. So animals selected in the upper, lower quartile part of the population and how these traits interact with the environment. High novelty prefer rats indeed are more novelty prefer in an enriched environment. As I told you, this here in peak is the enriched environment and here the standard condition. All the HR rats but two and all the LR rats but one are in the standard condition as opposed to the enriched environment. So we can't even consider trait environment interactions with regard to loco locomotor reactivity to novelty because all the trait depends upon the standard, actually the environmental conditions. And if you try to shape a kind of personality-like investigation in these rats, so this is a polar plot of the z-scores for each of these traits. And this is the personality of rats in a standard environment. It's mainly driven by locomotor reactivity to novelty and sign tracking. In rats in an enriched environment, you first there's a shrinkage, okay? And it's driven mainly by sweetness preference and novelty preference. So there's, let's say, a, sh a shift towards hedonics-related processes. It's been shown already, if you put these animals in self-administration, rats from the enriched environment would self-administer less than rats, rats from the standard conditions. So enriched environment protects against the ac acquisition of drug self-administration. So that's, that's known. And now every single behavioral trait we've been investigating didn't predict well any differential propensity to acquire drug self-administration because we used 
a, a, a dose of drug that doesn't discriminate between, let's say, HR or LR rats. So high sweetness preference, low sweetness preference didn't differ, nor did differ high anxious, low anxious, nor did differ high novelty preference, low novelty preference, nor did differ single tracker. How, and HRLR obviously is the environment. But now, if you break down these traits, depending on the environmental conditions, these are high, novel, high sweetness preference, low sweetness preference from the standard conditions, high and low anxious animals, and high and low novelty preference animals from the standard conditions. So they don't differ. If you consider those that were in the enriched environment, what we observe is a divergence of the curves. Okay? There's a difference between the, blues, the blue guys here that you don't have between the, blue, the white guys here. And the difference mainly comes from the fact that low sweetness preference rats, that we know this trait protects against addiction, actually against acquisition of drug self infiltration, are further protected by the enriched environment. But the high sweetness preference rats are not protected by the enriched environment as compared to those from the standard conditions. Is that clear? We have the same with high anxious animals. They're even more protected than if they come from standard condition. And by high anxious animals from the enriched environment are not protected at all as compared to those from standard conditions. And the same applies to high novelty preference. So overall, what the enriched environment does is to render those that are already resistant more resistant to acquire drug self-administration. But it doesn't shift or it doesn't protect further those that are vulnerable. It just, it just enhances the resistance of those that are resistant. Yeah? This is about acquisition of drug self-administration. That's, that's 14 days. You know, they, they just start taking drugs. So now, and I'm sorry it's not really clear, but I did the stats here just before I gave my talk because the, the experiment is ongoing. Now, after 50 days, what happens? Actually, here in blue are guys in the enriched environment, and that's drug taking. So initially, they take less, and after 30 days, they shift, and they start taking more. And we have an en environment time interaction. They start taking more than rats in the standard condition. With regards to liver press during the no drug period, initially nobody differs, then the liver press increase, and rats from the enriched environment display much more liver presses during the no drug period than rats from the standard condition. That's one criteria of addiction act behavior. When, they, when we test their motivation on the oppressive ratio after 15 days of self administration, rats from the enriched environment tended to show increased breakpoints than what from the standard condition. But in the test yesterday, after 50 days, rats in the enriched environment indeed display much higher breakpoints than rats in the standard condition. And finally, if you shock them, rats in the enriched environment resist by 40% to punishment as compared to rats in the standard conditions. So all this story about enriched environment that we've heard, fair enough and which environment decreases the individual, actually it decreases the rate of cocaine self-administration as long as you measure it for two weeks. It decreases propensity to acquire cocaine self-administration, but only in animals that we know already that would have never developed addiction. But if you push them a bit, they are actually would develop addiction-like behavior. So that's another insight into considering chronic drug exposure as perhaps a better model of addiction than acute drug exposure. And considering genes, environment interactions in the field of addiction, I think is, is a key element of understanding the etiological and the contribution of the environment to the vulnerability towards a compulsive drug seeking behavior. <coughs> I'm done here, so thank you. So we, we just got a big grant to develop the three addiction-like
criteria model for heroin. The big issue with heroin, as far as in my hand, the big issue with heroin is that it is analgesic, much more than cocaine. So how do you want to actually check compulsivity based on, on food shocks? The only experimental design we found is to play with a ramp of shock intensities and durations and show that there is indeed a rightward shift, which is analgesia, but an upward shift that is compulsivity. And that this upward shift doesn't correlate with the effect of air infusions in the hot plate, whereas the rightward shift does. So once we've actually we've dealt with that, we, we're gonna we're gonna do that. But it's uh, it hasn't been done so far, and perhaps also because nobody nobody wants to do 100 days of self administration. That's true, isn't it? We didn't. We didn't. Uh, I left most of the molecular biology to Pierre Piazza. What is shown, and it's very interesting, is that the three quartal rats show an impaired long-term LTP in the ventral striatum. Zero quartal rats show initial LTD, and then they go to normal levels and LTP, and three quartal rats never come back to normal levels. So kind of rigid plasticity taking place in the ventral cell that makes me think that what we have in the transition to the DLS in impressive animals perhaps depends upon this kind of rigidity. But so far there's not much done with that. I was just going to ask, did you expect this result? No, not at all. It's completely counterintuitive. Yeah. And what does that mean for treatment? What it means for treatment <laughs> is, so to be absolutely fair, I, I wrote this grant because when I, when I came back to France, when you write a grant, when you want to come back to France, you've got to write a grant that fits with the theme of your lab. And they were working on an environment, so I did that. What is environmental enrichment? If you ask me to work less than 50 hours a week, I would feel really stressed. If you ask someone, my neighbor, to work more than 50 hours a week, he would commit suicide. Actually, the notion, and, and so we play with these notions of inter-individual differences, and we consider that a standard condition, and another standard condition that is just shifted, is an, an enrichment for everyone. It, it, it just doesn't make sense. What it tells you is, indeed, environmental conditions shape the personality, shape how the behavioral traits interact with each other. That's very important. It shapes many responses. But when you think of whether it influences that much this hardcore propensity to develop a neuropsychiatric disorder, I think here we show that it doesn't, and if it does, perhaps it enhances. And one easy answer would be rats from an enriched environment, when they are here for two hours and a half, they are deprived. They go from four per cage with toys from nothing. And if they've got nothing to do, they've got to cope with that. You know, whereas rats in standard conditions, that's their life. So these are just retrospect analysis, but indeed we didn't expect that. But it's interesting that it turns out to be that way. Because first we reproduce all the literature before two weeks, and then it's a completely different story. For sure. Um, Carol has, has made so much work. On, yeah. For sure.
wonder if that's even that's technically that's feasible, if that's maybe That's an excellent question. I suggest you have a look at um, the, the work of a good friend of mine, Aldo Badiani. So he uses rats that have been, actually, uh, that have received two catheters, one for one drug, one for another drug, and some of these animals live in the safe administration setting. And you give them choice between cocaine and heroin, and they would prefer safe administering heroin where they live and cocaine outside. And those that live outside the occasion setting would prefer safe administering cocaine than heroin because it's outside. And heroin, actually, heroin is good on its own. Cocaine enhances stimulation. So obviously, if you have new, I'm pretty sure, like, if we put lights in our boxes, you know, like, like in casinos, we would have an upward shift in the rate of self-administration. Because rats would self, uh, heroin would feel, cocaine would feel better. So you're absolutely right. Actually, we receive them. They stay in the in the room for a week to get habituated to the reversed light shift. And after a week, we just put them in two environmental conditions. And you typically leave them in the dark as well. Always. Just to ask a little question about your rats, because we only take the alpha male cortiles. What do you do with the milk guard? Do they just get? So we use them. Oh, we always use them because yeah. we combine between subject design in our analysis with always dimensional analysis. So all the correlations, they yeah, they all go through. Because otherwise, there's no way you can say this is a three of the, or, so they all go through. And we have either dimensional analysis, so let's say environment increases novelty preference, regardless the trait, and then you can say an environment increases even further novelty preference in high novelty prefer. So we have a collaboration with David Goldman. So every single rat we have in the lab, when he leaves, we take the liver. So what, so they all go through different you know behavioral training, and uh, and drug administration. So we take the liver, and then there's a systematic polymorphism analysis behind it. Do you have any results so far on that? Not at all. The only results I can the only. Cellular results, okay, I can't get access to that. What we've shown, I'm sorry, I can't show you the data, is every single neurological adaptations that take place in the brain, let's say increased or decreased dopamine transporter levels spreading from the ventral to the dorsal sphere. When I show you these results, I'm pretty sure you consider this was neuronal, right? We've just shown that if you train rats on the signal shield reinforcement, Take the brains, punch the entire structures, DLS, DMS, accumbens, or dissect the structures and culture astrocytes. All the that decrease that you observe, yeah, from the punches is accounted for by a complete washout of that expression in the astrocytes. Complete. And it has physiological significance. One astrocyte can cover up to 10,000 synapses. The, that on the astrocytes is there to buffer that dopamine that spills over the synapse. If you don't have that anymore there, then first you can recruit adjacent loops in the intracellular process, and you can synchronize ventral and dorsal stratum dopamine dependent processes. So all of these adaptations we have actually we look at, and when we do arrays on punches, we always keep actually we always think yeah that you know this is function, this is neuron. And GLT we discussed about is is astrocytes. Yeah. So there's there's definitely something also in outside the neuron world. So these are the only cellular that I can show you. Sorry. Yep. You may have mentioned this and I may have missed it. I'm sorry in advance, but do these rats, the high impulsive and low impulsive rats, do they um, differ in affective behavior, anxiety or depression? They don't differ in anxiety. I'm going to be controversial, but uh, to me, depression is not an affective behavior. And, um, and we haven't tested them in, in the 
triadic model of learn helplessness, for instance. And that's so baseline, right? Yeah. So How I can't tell you. So what Jeff Daly has shown that if you give high impulsive animals access to cocaine, they self-medicate their impulsivity on their cocaine. They are not impulsive anymore, and the decreased binding of D2 receptors comes up. You, you prevent them from accessi accessing the drug. After 24 hours, impulsivity comes back, and D2 receptors go down. So in high impulsive animals, there's a self-medication <coughs> of this underlying neurological core mechanism in the ventral cerebellum that might also account for the fact that they shift less easily to the DLS control of behavior because they initially take drug perhaps as a self-medication, so that's more goal-directed than other animals. Yeah? No? better than I do. And better than I do is doing this approach on the seeking taking task in which there's a condition reinforcement component. And that's that's the model I'm developing now. So rats press one lever. Every 10 lever press, they receive the drug-related stimulus, as in the Q-control drug-seeking experiment I showed you. So their behavior on this lever is habitual and is dependent upon the environment. Then they, re they have the taking lever. And you can punish either the seeking response or the taking response. So psychologically, you can tease apart whether this is seeking or it is taking. And then you have motivation on the seeking or the taking lever. And you can introduce no drug period. And you have a seeking, taking component controlled by the behavior of the responses and an approach that is based on several criteria that has been op have been operationalized and shown to have face construct and predictive validity. So I think the, so as far as we could go, that would be the ultimate level. But introducing internal differences, so I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but the answer is huge cohorts, because here we work 100 days and we end up with five rats. If you look at the ends, you know, we, four, five, six, that's it. 100 days, five rats. But I think these rats are perhaps more precious than 1,000 rats after two weeks. But that's, that's my, if I didn't believe that, it would be a real <coughs> to do that, okay? So that's, that's a belief, but definitely if, that's the same question we had yesterday. The two weeks of self-administration, these are very important studies because you understand the adaptation to drug exposure. And that's actually, that concerns every one of us. We all take <coughs> drugs. Our brain has been changed, and it's important to understand how. So that's, you know, that's very important, but if you really claim you want to work on addiction, you need features of addiction on a specific subset of a population. Otherwise, there's no heuristic value. Do you think we should like, get those rats for three criteria, or when, once you've done that model and have some the precious rats, and breed those, and everyone use those rats, so that we're working on more adequate what could be fun is once you've bred them, you apply the same, the same strategy. And you would end up with rats that are resistant or not. So the point is breeding, I think, breeding isolates core polymorphisms that account for one part of the phenotype. And I much prefer, I think it's more ecological to take a cohort and isolate vulnerable rats from this cohort. But definitely, you know, Jeff Daly, ask him, he's, I think he's now generation 32 in the high impulsive animals. So you, you can have access to them. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you.